witnessed. Uh, we recently witnessed a uh, something in our nation's capital just in the last couple of days. And I'm not going to take the stand one way or the other on this, um, because when we're dealing with restrictions and so on, I know what it's like to be growing weary of all of these restrictions. I'm getting tired of not being able to visit people. I'm getting tired of not being able to do things. So I know what it's like. But on the other hand, I also realize that some of the things that we have been asked to go through, we've been asked to go through for the benefit, not only of ourselves, but of others. But yesterday, um, actually Friday and yesterday, um, a whole bunch of truckers showed up at, uh, at the parliament in Ottawa. And uh, it was called the Freedom Convoy. Regardless of where you stand on this, the reality is that sometimes something that starts with a very good intent can often find itself going astray. There's an inherent problem that we have when we try to um, stand up and when we try to protest. And that inherent problem is that many times we attract people that do not have the same agenda that we have. And as I watched what was going on, I felt very sorry for the truckers because I really felt that their um, the reason for their doing this had been hijacked. And many times what happens is when you have people coming together, not all with the same basis of belief, not all coming from the, for the exact same reason, what happens is that the message can become something that it was never meant to be. That's what happens when radicals join uh, in with a group of people who are trying to make a point. And so therefore, the point that they're trying to make may not come across and may be even lost in all of the confusion. Last week, we highlighted three areas where um, Christian morality is challenged. Three areas where uh, our churches can find ourselves victims of a very similar plight. We, and I gave you three things that I said are, are things that can lead us uh, unwittingly towards that and our what we believe in what we stand for being hijacked and i told you that when we focus on acceptance but not on accountability that that is one of the first steps towards having your what you stand for being hijacked the second thing i said is when we focus on personal growth and not on an inner morality, uh, that's another step that often leads uh, to this very thing. And the third I gave you, which is the one I kind of want to focus on today, is that when we focus on forgiveness, but not on reconciliation, um, our message often becomes hijacked. I want us to look at scripture this morning and um, to see how this can become a problem um, so easily within what we do. And I want us first to look at the story in John chapter nine, or sorry, John chapter 11. The story of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. 
And I want us to see some very key things here. Uh, I'm not going to pick apart that passage at this point. I'm not going to uh, really highlight a lot of things from it. Other than I want us to see some uh, innate things that we as human beings do and innate ways in which we think uh, that can lead to us becoming hijacked. The first thing I want us to understand is that we are all individuals. Every one of us are individuals. And as individuals, that means that sometimes we grow at different rates. Uh, to give you just a very basic example of that was, uh, I'm 11, year, 11 months older than my younger brother, Tony. But by the time Tony was two years of age, he was already taller than me. Tony stands today six foot four, where I stand five foot five and a half. Got to add that fat, half in, got to make that, you know. And uh, so we grew at different rates. Although I was older, he very quickly surpassed me. And so it is in the, in the Christian faith. You may come to the Lord. You may put your faith in him. Someone else may come along and they may very quickly outstrip you, very quickly grow to a maturity which you haven't uh, achieved yet. And that is because we are individuals and we all grow at a different rate. And because of that, we also learn different lessons. We experience different things and those different things cause us to uh, go in certain directions in our faith. And so what we have here is we have these basic differences between us that can cause us to see things totally different. Some people have a tendency to see black and white. In other words, some people will sit down and they'll look at scripture and they'll see the exact words that are written there and that's what they see. Other people can sit down with that exact same passage and they can look beneath the surface and they can, they can gain an understanding which the other person doesn't gain because the other person is only looking at the words. Whereas the, the second person is not only looking at the words, but also looking at all the circumstances around it. And even though scripture is not of any private interpretation, and that means that none of us really have the right to actually think that we know everything about it and that we're the only ones who are right, okay? We're not. Even I do not always have the right way of thinking about things. And sometimes uh, I'm thankful for people who direct me and get me back on track or for re the opportunity to sit down and read the Bible and read something that forces me to get back on track. But why is that possible? Why, doesn't Christ why do not Christians just sit down and exactly believe exactly the same thing? This is one of the things which some movements, some radical movements within Christianity tries to do, tries to force everybody into believing exactly the same thing. Um, and you're forced into a mold. And if you don't fit that mold, then you're not welcome to be part of that fellowship. God operates differently. God understands that I have an ability to understand certain things where someone else might not have that same ability. So therefore, it's not that the message is different. It's just that God takes extra effort in trying to help the other person to see something that I naturally see. In other words, God accommodates us and our weaknesses. And he moves in a way and he shares his word in a way that will hopefully move us both towards 
a direction of growth. But that the way that we get there is going to be different. And so this is something that we need to understand. And this is something that is spoken about in scripture because in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 3 and verse 2, Paul says to the Corinthian church, I would love to feed you solid food, but I can't because you're only able to digest milk. There are some people who can only digest certain things. And there are other people who can digest much greater things. When I was a baby, um, I ended up having to stay on the bottle until I was two years of age. In fact, my younger brother, Tony, was off the bottle before I was. And the reason for that was I had digestive problems that I could not handle the solid food like he could. And God knows whether we can handle solid food or whether we uh, need to stay on, on the milk or on the, on the baby food. And God accommodates us in that way. Now, his desire is that we would all grow and become mature and that we would all want the uh we would all want the the meat of the word rather than the milk but god understands that we all grow at a different rate we all understand things differently that's how why it's so difficult sometimes to share the word of god with people that's why it's so difficult to find a sermon and allow that sermon to speak equally to everybody it's because it's not going to there are times you have to stop and you have to slow down and uh, deal with an individual rather than a whole group we see this in the story of the resurrection of lazarus and we see it particularly in lazarus two sisters mary and Martha, have you ever noticed the difference in this story? When Martha comes to Jesus, Martha says to Jesus, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. And Jesus has to remind her that he is the resurrection and the life. When Mary comes to him, Mary says basically the same thing. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. But Jesus does not take the time to chastise her or anything and uh, and even remind her that he's the resurrection and the life why because there was a difference in the understanding of these two women when we're first introduced to mary and martha we find that martha is busy uh trying to make sure everything's in its proper place and uh all the needs of the people are being met and so she's out in the kitchen and she's running here, there and everywhere and trying to do all these things. She is so focused on the exterior, the outer things, the things that need to be done. Where's Mary? Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to Jesus. And uh, Martha goes to Jesus and says, make my sister come and help me. And Jesus says, why should I do that? She has chosen the better place. And so understand that many times what you believe, why you believe it, may not be exactly what another person believes or why they believe it, because they may not have come to that conclusion. So this is the inner workings of John chapter 11. But what was the purpose behind the story of John chapter 11? It's amazing to us that when Jesus hears that one of his best friends is sick, that he doesn't immediately respond. That's sometimes hard for us because we want God to immediately respond to our needs. Instead, Jesus purposely waits until he knows that Lazarus is dead. And he says to his disciples, let's go to Bethany and let's uh, uh, see Lazarus. And, and they say, well, if he's sleeping, because Jesus said that he was sleeping. 
if he's sleeping well, that's good. You know, that means that he, he'll get healthy. And Jesus looks at them and says, no, he's already dead. So why, would, why do you want to go there, Jesus? You had the opportunity to go, but you didn't go. And Jesus tells his disciples that the reason that he didn't go was that he might be glorified and that they might come to understand exactly who he is. When he gets to Bethany and Martha comes running and uh, she, she is expressing her deep grief to him. He says to her, this is for a purpose. He doesn't have to say this to Mary, but he has to say to Mary, uh, to Martha, that this is for a purpose. And the purpose is so that you might understand who I am. That you might understand I am the resurrection and life because he asked her, I'm the resurrection and life. Do you, do you believe me? And she said, yes, I believe that, you know, in the end times, you know, when the resurrection takes place, that uh, we'll be resurrected. And, and Jesus is saying, no, I need you to understand that even now I have the ability to do this. And so we understand or have to understand uh, John chapter 11, both from the, from the basis of understanding that God deals with us individually, um, and also with the understanding that God has a purpose behind what he does, and uh, sometimes he has to get us to see that purpose, because it doesn't always come naturally for us to see the purpose of God in things from there I, I want to move on to this issue of understanding forgiveness and reconciliation because i i said last week that one of the reasons why the church struggles one of the reasons why sometimes we get off track is that we have a focus on forgiveness but we don't have a focus on reconciliation the two must go hand in hand but it becomes very easy for us to separate the two, to think of them as two entities uh, and therefore overemphasize one to the exclusion of the other. And we, that's a natural thing that we do. Again, it goes to this idea that there are some things which I will understand very easily, but then there are other things which I do not understand. And some people will understand it because they can see, they can see be, between the words, they can read between the words to what is underneath where other people can only see the words. And so when we talk about forgiveness and reconciliation, we must realize that in scripture, the idea of forgiveness of gaining God's forgiveness is never separated from the idea of reconciliation. The whole reason why we need forgiveness is to be brought into a point of reconciliation. God understood this. And even when Adam and Eve sinned there in the garden, God already put in place a way to help them to be reconciled to him. In the early Jewish faith, in the time of Moses, uh, particularly, uh, and the solidifying of the law, there was this establishment of the sacrificial system. And one of the ways that the sacrificial system is seen is in the fact that uh, God told Moses to build a tabernacle. Now, again, understand that God did not say, just go build a tabernacle. God gave to Moses the exact plans because this tabernacle was to illustrate salvation. This tabernacle was to illustrate the means of salvation 
and the means of salvation would be through his son, Jesus Christ. And so when the sacrificial system was first established, someone would come and they would feel a separation from God. And this idea of separation was made much more visible in the fact that uh, it, inside the curtain, inside the tabernacle itself was where the sacrifices were made and where one could be uh, right with God. But around that whole thing was this wall of curtains which prevented you from going in. And that wall of curtains was a barrier. And so our sin is a barrier to our fellowship with God. In fact, Isaiah says, if you regard iniquity in your heart, God will not hear you. In other words, if you know within your heart that you've done something and you have not asked God for forgiveness of it, do not expect God to hear you when you pray. Because God will turn a deaf ear. You first of all need to repent. You need to ask for forgiveness and have that removed or else it'll stand in the way of your fellowship with God. And so in the, in the sacrificial system, we have these curtains which stand as a barrier to the people being able to enjoy the fellowship with God. The only place they can get that fellowship is going through the door. And of course, the door symbolizes Jesus Christ in a wonderful way, which I don't have time to go into today. In fact, it would take me two or three weeks to be able to, to share that with you. But the sacrificial system, which God gave to them uh, as the children of Israel, revealed to them that their separation from God. And that getting God's forgiveness was the first step towards being reconciled to God. And so the two went hand in hand. Then we have the teachings of Jesus. And you may notice that I started with uh, um, Matthew chapter four, uh, Matthew, sorry, Matthew chapter six this morning, um, where we have the Lord's prayer, that pattern prayer that is given to us. Have you ever really noticed that in that prayer, you are praying and you're saying to God, forgive us our trespasses, period. No, there's no period. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive the trespasses of others. And so here is this idea of forgiveness and um, reconciliation being married together, even in what Jesus taught us. In other words, in order to truly enjoy the forgiveness of God, you need to be willing to be reconciled to God. But not only to God, to others. Because Jesus goes on right after that prayer. And he says in verses 14 and 15, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly father will forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, God will not forgive your trespasses. And so Jesus takes his idea of forgiveness and reconciliation, not only from the viewpoint of uh, we need to be reconciled to God, but that we need to be reconciled to one another. Now that's not always possible. And there are times when that might have to be delayed uh, because we are human beings. And because we're human beings and we operate at different times uh, and, and so on, um, and we have different understandings, we're not always on the same page. But the idea is that as much as possible, and this is what Paul says, as much as possible, live peaceably with all men. In other words, if it's at all possible, try to be reconciled to one another. Now, there is the understanding that sometimes that isn't possible. But Jesus says, if you do not forgive others their trespasses against you, then don't expect God to forgive you. 
And the only way you can have that true forgiveness is by being willing to forgive others and willing to move into that place of submission to God. Paul then picks up on this in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verses 18 and 19, where he says, we are not only, we are not only um, reconciled to God through faith, but God has given to us this ministry of reconciliation. In other words, the work that God has committed to us is to show to this world through our reconciliation with one another, the love of God. So it is important that we understand that forgiveness is never divorced from reconciliation. First, reconciliation to God, and secondly, reconciliation to those that are around us. And so I want us to understand that there may be some who approach Christianity with the idea that, oh, I've asked God for forgiveness, therefore everything's okay. I have counseled numerous people, and I have counseled numerous people who have done things to hurt other people. And more often than not, I have heard them say to me, well, I ask God for forgiveness, and that's all I have to do. No. You have to go that other step. Just like Christ went to the step of the cross, dying for us to reconcile us to God. He didn't need to be reconciled. But he was willing to do that to reconcile us. We need to be willing to take that extra step sometimes and go and make things right with one another. If we don't do that, then we're running the danger of our faith being sidetracked, being taken over with some other philosophy. That is not what God meant for us to enjoy. So my challenge to you today is don't let your faith be sidetracked. Don't let your faith be hijacked by a lack of reconciliation when it's possible. Because that will stand in the way of your relationship with God. Let's pray. Father God, help us to understand that in scripture and in all that you have done, reconciliation was always the goal. And the means for reconciliation was always for us to ask for forgiveness. When we bow before you, humble ourselves and ask you for forgiveness, that opens the door for us to be reconciled to you. But God, that can be hijacked. If we have an attitude that just focuses on ourselves, not on others around us. If we think that we have done all that we need to do, and we don't need to do anything more, when God, we may need to ask forgiveness from someone that we have hurt. Help us to work through those details. Help us to seek reconciliation where and when it's possible, Lord. Because when we don't, that allows a root of bitterness to rise up in our own hearts, as well as the hearts of those around us. We can only show the true love of God when we're willing to be reconciled to one another. Challenge us with, with these thoughts, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.